Okie dokie. Today we are going to discuss Saxon Math 87, lessons 92, 93, and 94. So go and get out your Saxon book and let us begin. Go and turn to page 564. Page 564. Now I'm going to be doing my math in pen, which I don't recommend for you guys, but uh, this will help it show up better on the video. So, lesson 92 is about finding percents again, which you've already done plenty of. Uh, this is just going to be a little twist where you're trying to find the percent of things after they've been changed. So case in point, let's look at problem, practice problem A. Practice problem A. Lesson 92. All right. What do we got here? The, re the regular price was $24.50, but the item was on sale for 30% off. What was the sale price? Now, I'm assuming at this point, you guys have carefully read through the chapter. So you've seen their take on everything. And now you're sitting down. You're going to use the practice problems to help you prepare for the problem set. Of course, that's what I'm assuming. So um, before we walk through this together, why don't you take a moment to try and figure it out on your own. That way you'll know if you're doing things correctly. So go and look at practice uh, test a, and the regular price was $24.50, but the item was on sale for 30% off. What was the sale price? I'll pause for a moment. Okay. So, we've got the regular price. I'm going to just call that P. Was $24.50. But the item was on sale for 30% off. What was the sale price? So you're not going to pay $24.50 for that. It's 30% off. Well, there's two ways we could go about figuring this out. So if I want to find the sale price, let's call that S. That's going to be my original price, which is $24.50, minus the original price, $24.50, times... 30%, which is in decimal form, is 0 0.30. So if you take that and subtract that, you will get the sale price. Now there's another way we could look at this, though, and that is the sale price. Since the sale price represents 30% off the original price, another way of saying that is the sale price is simply 70%, or 0 0.70, of the regular price. Those two things say the same thing. Which way you do it, you're going to get the same answer. So we've got 24.50 times 0.7, or we're taking the original price and subtracting 30%, which is the same as saying finding 70% of the original price, because 70 and 30 are, of course, 100. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Um, I'm going to be using a slide rule today, because slide rules are awesome. So I need to multiply 2450 by 70. So we will just line the index up here, right there on the seven. And then I will move this up here to 24, 21, one, two, three, four, 24, 50, oh no, sorry, 2450 is going to be right smack dab there. Right, right. Um, I've made a horrible mistake. That, of course, is 1.7. That is not 0.7. So let's do it this way. Put this over here at 7, yes. And then let's put this down at 2.4. Two point four one two three four fifty. Let's 
going to be right there. Okay, so this tells me the answer is 1, 7, 1, and it's halfway between there, so it's 5. Now, one thing slide rules don't, for you, do, don't do for you is figure out your decimal places. So you have to do that on your own, but you can see that 70% of 2450 will be $17.15. So there's your sale price right there. All right, splendid, splendid. All right, let's look at problem B. The number of students taking algebra increased 20% in one year. If 60 students are taking algebra this year, how many took algebra last year? Now, we have to be careful here because if we look at this the same way and we say, okay, well, if it increased 20%, that means 60 must represent 80% of the total. And that is not true. And to see why, let's go ahead and figure that out. So we've got 60, and I'm going to find 80% of it. So times 0.80, or just 0.8 is fine. Right. Uh, we don't need a calculator for that because that's just going to be 480, so, well, 4,800 and then move it twice. Anyway, that's going to be 48. So this should tell us that there were 48 students last time, and this year there's 20% more, which is 60. But 20% more of 48 is not 60 because 20% of 48 is 4.8. I'm sorry, 10% of 48 is 4.8, so that means 20% is 4.8 times 2, or 9.6, and we can't have 9.6 students. So it's incorrect to think that because we've increased by 20%, that our previous value represents 80% of the total. What's really going on here is that your student population last year So there's this many students going this year. The student population last year, and let's see, what should I use for that? I'll use the letter A for algebra students. Okay, so the number of students this year, which is 60, should be the number of students we had last year plus 20% of the number of students we had last year which is 0 0.20, or 20%, times the number of algebra students we had last year. Right? Now, if it helps, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. this. This A here is really just 1A. We don't normally write the 1, but it's always there. So I can add those two together. So this says 60 equals 1 plus 0.2, so that's 1.2A. All right, splendid. So now I just need to solve for A, and that will tell me how many students were in the class last year. So to do that, I need to get rid of this 1.2, and since it's multiplied, that means I need to divide it. So the 1.2s here cancel out. So we're over here, we just got A. I'll just write that on the left side here. It's fine. And on this side, we have 60 divided by 1.2. Well, 12 goes into 60 five, uh, five times, but... We have to add a decimal place because we're dividing. So that means there were 50 students in last year's class. And now let's check that number to see if that makes sense. So there were 50 students last year. 10% of that is 5. So 20% of 50 is 10. And so if I add 10 students onto those 50, that gives me 60 students, which is 20% more than I had last year. So... The 60 here represents 120% of the original, not like the sale price we had on uh, whatever it was that they bought in the problem A. So 50 is the answer. All right, let's look at C then, where Tom buys a bike and they were on sale for 20% off, and Tom bought one for $120. How much did he save by buying the bike at the sale price instead of at the regular price? So that means that he paid $120, but that $120 represented 
the cost of the bike after the 20% discount. So problem C. So $120 should represent the cost of the bike, I'll just call that B, okay, minus 20%, 0.20, times the cost of the bike, B. There we go. All right, so that means 120. Well, again, if we look at this as 1B, I can subtract those two. 1 minus 0.2 is 0.8 times B. And that makes sense, right? Because whatever the cost of the bike is, if you take 20% off, that represents 80% of the original price. So 80% of the original price should be the price he paid at $120. So there we go. Um, now I want to get the B all by itself, so I've got to divide by 0 0.8. So that means the cost of the bike that we're looking for is 120 divided by 0 0.8 zero or just point eight all right well let's get all our trusty little slide rule for this so we've got to take 120 so I can set this up at point eight there we go right there there point eight and I want to take my target here down to 120, which for us is 1.2, so there's 1.2. And since we're dividing, I've got to look at the bottom scale, D, and go up to the C scale. Go up, if we're multiplying, we go down. So um, if we put this at 1.2, you can see that's right at the 5, which is 1.5, because there's the 1 over there, 1.5 right there. So if we account for the decimal places here, that means... The original cost of the bike was $150. But wait, we're not done, because the question is, how much did Tom save by buying at the sale price? Well, the original price was 50, the sale price was 120, Tom saved $30. And there we go, splendid, splendid. All right, D. The clothing store bought shirts for $15 each and marked up the price 80% to sell the shirts at retail. What was the retail price of each shirt? All right, well, I'm going to use R to represent the retail price, okay? So if you think about that, they bought these shirts for 15 bucks a piece and said, you know what? We should mark those up 80% of the $15 and sell them for that. All right, well, well let's do that. So there's our 15 bucks, and we're going to add to that 80% of 15 bucks all right so that means the retail price should simply be equal to now again um, this is 15 and 15 so um, we can look at this there's two ways to look at this you could just do it that way take 15 and multiply that or this 15 represents the retail price represents 180 or 1.80% or of the uh, original price they paid, 15. So either way, if you look at it as the 15 they paid, they're going to add 80% to that. Or if you can see that that means that 15 times 180 or 0.18 um, or 1.8 rather is uh, the same. These two say the same thing. So if you, if you understand what I'm saying here, great. If you don't, well, just, just do this. You know, you get the same answer. So I'm going to take 15 times 1.8. So let's see. I'll put this at 15. Put this at 1.8. Hang on. My cat's making a noise, which usually means she has a mouse in her mouth. Stay there. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, okay, can I have the mouse? Can I have the mouse? Drop it, drop it, drop it. Good girl, good girl, okay. Oh, oh, oh. 
Okay, she had a live mouse in her mouth, and I was unable to, I get her to drop it, but then the mouse ran away. So uh, I'll try and save it in a minute, because right now it's safe under a box. All right, so where were we? Yes, we're going to multiply 1.5 times or 15. 15 times 1.8. Okay, so where were we? We were going to line this up, uh, and then I'm gonna go up here to 15, which is right there. No, it's not. Yeah, 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 that's right. Oh no, I've gotta go in point eight. Sorry, I got a little lost there. Okay, so we've lined this up here at um, 1.5, which is right there, and we're gonna multiply that by point eight, so it looks like that is 2.7, or in this case, 27. So the retail price of the shirt is $27. Okay, and there we go. Excellent. All right, let's turn our attention to problem set 93. Two-step equations and inequalities. Now, once again, by the time you're watching this portion of this video, you've certainly worked through all the example problems and read the lesson text with, with great care and uh, comprehension. So now it's just a matter of let's see how we're gonna work these problems here. And we'll work all the practice problems here. So let's turn to page 571 and start with practice problem A. 8x minus 15. Okay, there's the cat and she doesn't have a mouse with her, so good. 8x minus 15 equals 185. And your job for all of these is to solve the equation, which means we're going to need to figure out what x is. So to do that, we need to get x on one side and everything else on the other. You guys have done problems like these before. Now, my first step to isolate that x is to get rid of the 15. Now, since the 15 is subtracted over here, remember our rules here. I can move anything I want back and forth across the equality as long as I change its sign. So if this is a minus 15, I can just put it over here if I then make it a plus 15. And that's what I want to do. I want to get it out of here and over there. So that means we only have 8x equals 185, but now not minus 15, but plus 15. All right, splendid. That means 8x equals 185 plus 15, which correct me if I'm wrong, but that is 200. So now I want to get the x all by itself. So to do that, since 8 is multiplied by it, I need to divide by 8. So I divide by 8 here. That's just x because 8 over 8 is 1. So on this side, I just have 200 divided by 8. And if you give a quick little thought to that, you'll realize that that must be 25 because there's eight quarters and two dollars. So yeah, 25. So X equals 25. Okay, and that will be the direction that we'll take with most of these problems here. So let's look at B. We've got 0.2Y plus 1.5 equals 3.7. Now again, if you haven't done that yet, go and try and do it now and then see if your answer matches mine. Okay? Okay. So again, I want to get this 0.2y all by itself. So I need to get rid of this 1.5 on this side and put it over here. Now it's positive here, so I'll just move it across the equality and make it negative. So now I have 0 0.02y on the left side, and on the right side I have 3.7, not plus 1.5, but minus 1.5. So now I have 0.2y, I'm not gonna write the zero there, is equal to 3.7 minus 1.5. Well, that's the same as 33 minus 15, which is 22, or in our case, 2.2. All right. So now, to solve for y, I need to divide by 0.2. Because if I divide this side by 0 0.2, 0 0.2 over 0.2, that's just 1. So that means y will be equal to 2.2 divided by 
point two. All right. If we balance out the decimal places, top and bottom, that's the same as saying 22 over 2, which is the same as 11. There you go. Did you get 11? I'll bet you did. Bet you did. All right. C. Three-fourths. M. Minus one-third. Equals one-half. Now, I personally like fractions. I think they're kind of fun. But I appreciate that I'm... My, my, that my opinion uh, of fractions is not universally shared. So, I think the best way to deal with this, so you don't have to mess with the fractions, is to get rid of the fractions straight away. And the way we can do that is, pick a number that will multiply both sides of the equation by, that'll get rid of all the fractions. So look at your denominators. I have a four, a three, and a two. Can you think of a number that four, three, and two all go into? Well, yeah, there's go gobs of them, but what's the smallest of the number? It doesn't have to be the smallest, but that way, using the smallest saves us some work later on. So what's the smallest number that four, three, and two all go into? Well, I think that number is 12. 4 goes into 12, 3 goes into 12, 2 goes into 12. So that means if I multiply both sides of this equation by 12, so 12 times 3 fourths m minus 1 third should be equal to 1 half times 12. Remember what algebra says. I can do absolutely anything I want to one side of an equation as long as they do the same thing to the other side. And that's what we've done. We've picked the number 12, just plucked it out of air because it makes sense. And we're just multiplied to both sides. That maintains the equality. So 12 times 3 fourths. Remember, we've got to distribute this 12 to there and to there. So let's start with the 3 fourths. The four, well, I'll write that out. So that's going to be 12 times 3 over 4m minus 12 times 1 over 3 is equal to 1 half times 12. Now, if it helps, you can view all of these as 12 over 1 because the point here is that because we chose 12, all these fractions should now disappear. And indeed, 4 goes into 12 three times. 3 goes into 12 four times. And 2 goes into 12 six times. So this just becomes 3 times 3m which is 9m minus 4 times 1, which is 4, which is equal to 1 times 6, which is 6. That means 9m equals what? Well, I want to get this 4 over here. It's a negative here, so if I move it over here, it becomes a positive. So that's going to be 6 plus 4. So let me move right up here. 9m equals 10, so m I'm going to divide by 9 equals 10 over 9. And there we go. All right. Splendid. Splendid. All right. Let's do D. D says, oh, goodness, 1 and 1 half N plus 3 and 1 half equals 14. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to do the same trick here, but before we do, uh, oh, make sure I've written the problem down correctly, and I haven't. It's one and one half. All right. So step one, when we've got mixed numbers, is always to turn them into improper fractions. So one and one half is two times one plus one. So that's three over two times n. Three and one half is two times three is six plus one. That's seven over two equals 14. All right. Now again, let's try and get, let's get rid of the fractions. So we've got um, to pick a number that if I multiply these numbers by it, the fractions go away, and that number would be 2, right? Sure. So I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 2. Because what happens here is the 2's cancel out here, and 3 over 2n just becomes 3n. 7 over 2 just becomes 7. 
and 14 times 2 becomes 28. All right. Now I want to get the 7 from here over there. It's positive here, so I will subtract it over there. So 3n equals 28 minus 7. 3n equals 21. Okay, okay, good. Now I want to divide by 3 to get rid of that 3 there. So 3n over 3 is just n equals 21 divided by 3. And we all know that 21 divided by 3 is 7. There we go. 7. All right, let's do E. E. E says minus 6p plus 36 equals 12. Splendid. Now, I'm trying to isolate the p. This one's going to be pretty straightforward, right? Step one, get the 36 that's on the left side over to the right side. So that means on the left side, I just have the minus 6p. And I've taken the 36 over here. So since it's positive here, it becomes negative over here. So now I have minus 6p equals, well, what's 12 minus 36? Sure it is. You're right. It's minus 24. All right. So I want to get isolate the p. So I can do that by dividing by negative 6, because negative 6 over negative 6 is still 1. So p will equal to minus 24 divided by negative 6. Multiply divide by negative 6. Well, a couple things going on here. First off, 24 divided by 6 is, of course, 4. But the minuses, since I have a minus top and bottom, they cancel out, don't they? Yeah, so I have a positive 4 is my answer. So P equals positive 4. All right. F. 38 equals 4W minus... 26. Now, again, I know you guys have already done this, so let's just see if your answer matches mine. I want to get this 26 away from that 4w. Since it's negative here, I'll add it over here. So this is 38 plus 26 equals 4w. Excellent, excellent. So now I just need to add the 38 and the 26, and that, of course, is going to be what? Well, 64. So 64 equals 4 W. Now I want to isolate the W. I can do that by dividing everything by 4, can't I? Yes. So 4W divided by 4 is simply W, and that should equal 64 divided by 4. Now, don't be alarmed that I just suddenly swapped them around. You can just flip that over there, and I just like the letters to be on the left side, but it doesn't really matter. You could have written this is 64 over 4 equals W right there if you want. Same difference. So W equals 64 divided by 4, which we all know is 16. And there we go. There we go. Is that the same answer you got? Sure it is. Bet it was. Alrighty. Now we've got uh, G. So I've got a uh, minus... 5 thirds M plus 15 equals 60. Well, as is my way, and what I recommend for all of us, is to get rid of the fraction. So you can see the only denominator I have is 3. So I'll get rid of the fraction by multiplying the entire equation by 3, both on the left and the right, because these threes cancel out, don't they? And I'm left with minus 5m, three times 15, well, three times 15 is 45, and that equals three times 60, which is 180, three times six is 18, plus the zero, that's 180. All right, there you go. Now I wanna solve for m, that means I wanna get this 45 over here, so I have a minus 5m equals 180. Now, this was a positive 45. That means this is now a negative 45 because I crossed over the equality. 
So that means minus 5m equals 180 minus 140 minus 45, which is of course 135. Now to get m all by itself, I will divide by minus 5. So minus 5m with minus 5 is just m. So this becomes 135 divided by minus 5. All right, well, for starters, you can see that since the, denom the numerator is positive, the denominator is negative, my final solution has to be negative, okay? So how many times does 5 go into 135? Well, 5 goes into 13, how many times? How many times? That's right, 2, with a remainder of 3. So 5 goes into 35, 7 times. So m is minus 27. All right, well done there. H, 4.5 equals 0. 0.6 times D minus 6.3. Okie dokie. Well, we can do this a couple ways. And it depends on how comfortable you are working with your... Um, decimal numbers. So let's do it first, just with the decimal numbers, and let's look at another way we might have done it after that. So I'm just trying to solve for d, so let's start by getting rid of this 6.3, putting it over here. So that means on the left I have 4.5, this is a minus 6.3, so I'll make this a positive 6.3, and that still equals 0. 0.6 times d. Well 4.5 plus 6.3, I think we all know what that is, right? 4.4 4 and 6 is 10, and 5 and 3 is 8. So that's 10.8 equals 0.6d. So now to get d all by itself, I just divide everything by 0.6. So that means 10.8 divided by 0.6 should equal 0.6d divided by 0.6, which is just d. So um, because I only have one decimal place here and there, Let's we adjust that. That's the same as taking 108 divided by 6 equals D. So D is equal to, well, how many times is 6 go 108? 6 goes into 10 one time with a remainder of 4. 6 goes into 48 eight times. So D equals 18. Now, you also could have done that a different way. So let's go back to our original equation right here. And that is, what I could do is, if I'm clever about multiplying all of these by something, I can get rid of the decimal places. And let's do that by multiplying everything by 10. So if I take 10 times 4.5 should equal 10 times 0.6d minus 6.3. Because when you multiply something by 10, I take 5 times 10 equals 50, you're just moving the decimal place one space to the right. So 10 times 4.5 just becomes 45. 10 times 0.6 just becomes 6. And 10 times 6.3 becomes 63. There we go. So now I bring my 63 over. This is 45 plus 63 equals 60. Well, 45 and 63 is 108 equals 60. So D equals 108 divided by 6, so D equals 18. That's the nice thing about math. You know what trade you do it? You're always going to get the same, the, the, the same result, the right result. So there you go. So if you like this method, uh, that's nice. Get rid of the decimals. Or if you're good with decimals, just do that. All right. All right. Very good. Okay. The other portion of this section deals with graphing inequalities. So I've got 2x plus 5 is greater than or equal to 1. Now, we're going to treat this exactly the same way as we treated these. The fact that it says greater than or less than doesn't matter to us until we get to the very end. So just think of that as inequality. So the same thing we'll do, we're going to take this 5 and put it over there. So this becomes 2x is greater than or equal to 1 minus 5 because I moved it across the equality there. So that means 2x is greater than or equal to 1 minus 5, which is minus 4. So I'm going to solve for x by dividing by 2. So x should equal 
not equal, greater than or equal to minus 4 divided by 2. So my end result says x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So now I just need to graph that. So to graph that, I'll put that on a number line. And I'll put 0 there. That means minus 2 is, say, right there. I really don't need anything more than that. And it says that x, whatever it is, it's greater than or equal to minus 2. Since it's equal, we need to put a circle at minus 2. And since it's equal, that means we're going to fill in that circle. And then we'll just double up the line that goes in the direction of the arrow. x is greater than or equal to 2. So there's the solution, and that's what it looks like on the graph. So let's see how you did with j. We have 2x minus 5 is less than 1. So again, we're going to ignore, not ignore it, but we're going to treat it just like an equality. It doesn't play it until we get to the end. So I'll take my 5 over there. This says 2x is less than 1 plus 5. 2x is less than 6. Well, x is less than 6 over 2, which is 3. x is less than 3. So to graph that, I draw my number line. There's 3. Now, we need to put a circle there. Now, because it's strictly less than, I don't fill in the circle because it doesn't include 3. It just includes everything up to 3. So it includes 2.9999999, but it doesn't include 3. But it's everything less than that then, so I'll just double up everything again in the direction of the arrow. There you go. There's the graph to that. I'm sure that's probably what you did already. Okay, very good, very good. All right, one more module here then. Let's see. Ooh, compound probability. We like probability. Probability's fun. All right, let's look at the practice problems. Hang on, I need to get a couple props here. There's this. And I need a... Oh, there we go. There's a dice and a coin. I don't know where my other dice went. Hmm. Interesting. All right, probability. Now, we've looked at probability before. Probability is just the number of ways a particular event can happen divided by the number of ways all the events could happen. For example, here we have a coin. It's American 50-cent piece. There's the head, John F. Kennedy. There's the tail, Independence Hall in Philadelphia. So if I just flip this coin... Only one of two things can happen. It's either going to come up tails or it's going to come up heads. Or it's going to come up heads. <laughs> or it's going to come up heads. There we go. So the total number of ways that something can happen here is two. It's either heads or tails. But there's only one event that you get from flipping a coin. So the probability that it's either heads or tails is one half. Now, I rolled three tails in a row. What's the probability of that? Well, that's what this chapter is about, and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Simple probability with the dice. There's six possible numbers that can come up. So what's the probability that I'll roll any one of these numbers? Well... There's only one way to roll a number, but there's six possible numbers, so that's one out of six. So that's your basic probabilities, which you've learned already. This is talking about compound probabilities. For instance, as I said, what if I flip the coin? Oh, heads, excellent. And I do it again. What's the probability that I'll get two heads? Oh, and I didn't get it. Okay. Well, that's called compound probabilities. And to find out, to figure out compound probabilities, you're going to take the individual probabilities and multiply them together. Okay? Let's look at an example. On page 579, uh, practice problem A. 
To win the game, Victor needs to roll a nine with a pair of dice. What is the probability that he'll do that on the first try? Well, if you look in your book on page 577, there's a table that shows all the possible combinations of rolling two dice. In fact, where the heck are my dice? All right, so if I roll two dice, how many ways are there to roll two dice? Well, my first dice can be any one of six numbers. Drop my pen. My first die, my first die roll can be any one of six numbers. So there's six ways to roll the first dice. First die, sorry. And there's six ways to roll the second dice. For a grand total of six times 36, or 36 ways to roll two dice. And the table on 577 shows you all the possible combinations. So Victor has to roll a nine. Okay, all right, all right. So we know there's 36 possible outcomes. How many outcomes are gonna win Victor the game? Well, it's only true if he rolls a nine. So using two dice, how many ways are there to roll a nine? Well, you could roll a five on your first toss and a four on your second toss. That would give you a nine. You could roll a four on your first toss and a five on your second toss. That would give you a nine. You could roll a six on your first toss and a three on your second toss. That would give you a nine. And your first die could be a three and your second die a six, which would also give you a nine. Now, there's no other way to get a nine using the numbers one through six. All right, so that means there's four ways to get a nine. So four possible ways. And the total number of ways that anything can happen is 36. So both of those are visible by four. That means Victor's probability of winning is one out of nine. And that's right. So that's the probability of rolling a nine with two dice in one try. Boom. Nine. All right. There you go. Well, that was A. See, probabilities are kind of fun. Okay, draw a tree diagram like the one at the beginning of the lesson that shows the eight possible outcomes of a three of three coin tosses. Well, since you've certainly read the chapter already before you've watched this video, you know exactly the kind of thing they're talking about. They draw theirs vertically, or, or um, sorry, horizontally. I'm gonna draw mine vertically. So what we're saying is if I take this coin and toss it three times, one, I got a tail. Oh, good. Two. I got another tail. Interesting. And three. Okay. Ooh. Did I get three tails in a row? Amazing. Okay. So how many different ways are there for that to happen? We just did tail, tail, tail. That's only one way. So the way we'll do this is we'll toss the coin. Okay. So when we toss the coin the first time, it's either going to come up tails or heads. Okay. Let's say it comes up tails. We'll toss it a second time. So that's either going to come up tails or heads. Now, if we toss it one more time, let's say we, that was tails. We picked it up and tossed it again. That means, again, it's either tails or heads. If it was heads, the next toss is, again, either tails or heads. Over here, if we go back up to our first toss, say our first toss was a head, we toss it again, we either get a tail or a head. If we toss it a third time, we either get a tail or a head or a tail or a head. This represents all the possibilities that you can get from tossing a coin three times. And to write out all the possibilities, we just need to start at the top of the tree and just follow a branch all the way down. So let's start here. Tails, I'll just stay over to the left. Tails, tails. So there's one way we could toss three tails. 
That's what actually we did a moment ago. So there's one way, that's that one, all right? Another way would be the tails, tails, when we hit heads, all right? Tails, tails, heads, all right? So that goes this way. Now we go tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, burp, burp, burp. We go tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, heads. Now we go to the other branch of the tree. We could have gotten a head, a tail, and a tail. We could have gotten a head, a tail, and a head. We could have gotten a head, a head, and a tail. And we could have gotten a head, a head, and a head. So there you go. That's eight possible ways that you could get results from flipping a coin three times. Now, this is not part of the problem, but now ask yourself the interesting question. We rolled, or we flipped rather, three tails in a row. What's the probability that that would have happened? Well, you can see there's eight ways to flip a coin three times in a row, and only one of those eight is tails, tails, tails. So that means what we did there only had a one in eight chance of happening. Now that's assuming you have a fair coin. It could be that Kennedy's head is weighting this a little too heavily to one side, so it tends to fall that way. I just don't know about that. So, nonetheless, there you go. All right, so there's your tree. And then let's look at C. Jasmine is taking a four option multiple choice test. There are two answers she does not know. If she can correctly rule out one option on one question, but no options on the other question, what is the probability she will correctly guess both answers? All right, so let's call it question A and question B. Each one has four possible choices. She doesn't know, she's just gonna guess. But for question A, it says she's able to eliminate one. There's one of the choices there that she knows can't be right. So if she just guesses from the remaining ones, her chances of getting it right on a guess are just one out of the remaining choices, which is three. So her chances of guessing on question A and getting it right is one out of three. Now B, there's four choices. She can't eliminate any of them. So her ch chances of getting that right, right off the bat, is one out of four. So what's the probability that she'll get them both right? This is where the compound portion comes in. If I have different scenarios for mul different, multi different ways, different probabilities for different events, I want to find out what's the probability that all the events come true. I simply multiply all of those. So the probability that it shall guess and get both A and B right is one-third times one-fourth, which equals one-twelfth. So they'll show, oh, there's a one-twelfth probability that given those parameters, she'll get both questions right. Now, let's look at this compound notion back over to this. We know from writing it all out that the probability of getting tails, tails, and tails with three tosses is one out of eight. But we could have done that simply mathematically because the probability that the first toss is a tail is one out of two. The probability that the second toss is a tail is one out of two. The probability that the third toss is a tail is one out of two. So we multiply all those together. One half times one half times one half is one eighth. So now I might ask you, if I take a coin and flip it four times, what's the chance that I'll get four heads in a row? Well, we don't need to write them out because we know the probability of the first toss being a head is one out of two, the second toss, one out of two, the third toss, one out of two, the fourth toss, one out of two. So the probability of all those probabilities coming all in at the same time is one out of two times two times two times two, which is 16. Yeah. There you go. So probabilities are kind of fun. All right. So I hope that helped. You, um, uh, of course, I offer this uh, in an exercise, the purest of optimism. But you guys can always email me any questions you like having to do with your math. Um, your parents will have my email address. So, uh, there we go. Any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you.